<laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Bokken City Radio. I am Ivan Nunlow and Brian is out in London right now covering Wimbledon, but in his place I have the ever experienced Adam Abrowitz. Adam, how are you feeling today? Doing well. Um, yeah, um, thanks for having me on today. And I uh, just want to give a uh, you know, quick plug that uh, I wrote for uh, SaturnateBoxing.com, uh, which I've had for about four years. And can be followed on Facebook at SN Boxing and Twitter on SN Boxing. And let's get right to it. We're yeah, and I to just want to point out that I get a lot of tips from Adam. I constantly read his blog. It's a great blog. You should definitely bookmark it and visit after the show. Uh, Adam, we get started with a character in boxing, Adrian Broner taking on Sean Porter. What was initially quite a competitive fight, I felt, uh, or build up to in that respect. What did you think of that fight, and what happened with Adrian Broner? You know, I actually um, I actually wound up having it a little closer than some. I thought uh, Porter wound up winning by two points, but you know, with the late knockdown, it wasn't as if the fight was on the table at the 12th round. Um, he just wanted it more. Frankly, uh, I think he just fought with more determination, uh, a much higher punch volume. Broner had his moments with some counter punching and some solid shots. It's just, to me, it just came down to desire. And Broner did get the 12th round knockdown, but he just didn't fight with a lot of urgency throughout the fight. And that's, I'm not sure that their talent level was all that different. It just really came down to, you know, those intangible factors. You know, Porter just went in there and kept fighting and, and, and Broder didn't have that answer on the inside. So that 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 was in a nutshell was the difference for me. Was it Broner's lack of passion or lack of will? Because we all know how he looks so calm in the build up to the fight. But uh, probably a little bit arrogant, would you say, but we've come to expect that with Adrian Broder. But he normally performs. What what do you think didn't work for him? Well he didn't have a consistent answer for Porter on the inside. You know, so Porter made it a dogfight when he could, and and you know wrestled and you know had a lot of those close shots that he that's that's his formula. And Broner, you know, mostly held uh, on the inside. He got a point taken away for it, and he just looked uncomfortable. There was that counter left hook that Broner would throw to kind of uh, thwart Porter from coming in. But Porter just you know ducked under it or you know went past it, and and there wasn't enough answers consistently coming from Broner on the inside. He, he just got outworked. It's a, it's a sad state of affairs for Broner, who was calm and reassuring. It didn't seem like he lost after the fight. He made it sound as though it didn't bother him. It didn't really yeah, matter. He, he, yeah, he didn't seem broken up about it. That's certainly... Yeah, that's, uh, that's I something... Agree about that. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's normal for a boxer just to brush off a loss. Uh, to your point, I don't think it was that close. I think Broner got, got a gift in a 12th round of a knockdown. Just disappointed because he... His rise, and he is a three weight world champion, but his rise and his pretty much collapse right now, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit annoying because he has potential. Is this the right weight for him? I know he he made Sean Porter come down in weight. I mean, I don't think he should really be fighting above one forty. Uh, he's yet to prove that he can stay with elite fighters. There, he almost lost to Malinaji, who was not elite. Uh, Maidana beat him, knocked him down twice. Porter beat him. Uh, the real issue is I don't think Broner has enough power to fight the way that he does at 147 or close to that because those counter left hooks, as Porter comes in, the smaller guys, that hurts. That's enough to like keep them at a distance. And you know Porter can go through that. And Porter, despite that one shot, which is more of an off-balance thing, uh, and, and, and Broner capitalizing on a mistake, um, I don't think Porter was really hurt by what was coming back at him. And so I think Broner has to go to 140, and there's no guarantee with his training that he becomes elite there. I mean, that shit might have sailed. I'm not writing him off, but it's really not encouraging. Yeah, it'd be sad if he does end up as a journeyman, the the noble art of boxing, where you go if you're pretty much getting on the way out. I want to say he's a gatekeeper, but he needs to really up his... He really needs to motivate himself in order to fight. Yeah. Especially, you know, the way he portrays himself in public, people kind of want to see him get hurt, which is a bad place to be. Well, 
you know, there's always heels in boxing, and, and obviously Mayweather has done a, a good job of creating a large segment of boxing fans who want to see him lose. And, you know, Tyson at points in time had that too. Um, you know, the difference is you got to back it up. And so Broner has talked the talk, and he has some shtick, and some people find it funny, some people find it really annoying. But ultimately, people stop caring about you if you don't win. And, you know, so Broner will just be a sideshow until he beats really good fighters. And at this point in time, and at this weight, he's just not doing that. Where does he where does he go next then for Broner? That's a good question. Um, it really depends on you know he's obviously one of Heyman's you know quote unquote stars. I'm not calling him a star in the grand boxing world, but uh, I don't know what what, what um, you know Danny Garcia is coming up. Uh, Lamont Peterson's probably going to come up to 147. Uh, I don't know who from the Heyman world is staying at 140. I mean, there's certainly fighters they can find to rebuild a record and get a few wins. Um, I mean, I, I don't. I also don't know. I don't know if Broner is so is if his training is so bad it might be time to cash him out, or is it like you know someone has a come to Jesus moment and said, "Hey, Adrian, your career is going down the tubes unless you train, take yourself seriously uh, in the ring, and you know lose a set your sense of entitlement." If, if he can get that hunger, maybe he has a run on him at 140. I don't know. It's really, a lot of it's going to be what goes on in that camp and what goes on with him. Ironically, Adrian Broner did Instagram a photo of Broner Porter 2, so may give that what you will. Yeah, I saw that, and, and I'm sure he'd like it, and I'm sure he wanted the Mike Downer rematch too. Doesn't yeah. mean it will happen. We'll see. It's got to avenge those, but there, there was some other great boxing that night as well. We saw the return of Andre Ward taking on Paul Smith. Firstly, very disappointed in Paul Smith for coming in that overweight, especially against Andre Ward. We kind of saw it with Edward Rodriguez, ironically. And again, it happens to Andre Ward. Firstly, what did you think about that? Well, uh, he obviously didn't take his training very seriously. And even there was the next day weigh-in, you know, where he couldn't, you know, gain additional weight, and he blew that too. So that's the mark of a fighter who was there to, you know... Uh, Just cash out. Probably. I mean, he, he, listen, Paul, Paul Smith, it's not like he just took a knee and went down. I mean, he took a lot of shots in that fight. So when he got to the ring, you know, he acted like a fighter. But in, in leading up to it, you know, he just kind of blew off. He blew off training. I mean, he wasn't even close. Uh, uh, and, this, and this is a guy who's fought at 168. He's fought at 160. I mean, it's not like he's a naturally huge guy who was coming down weight. He just, he just blew off training. And it's disappointing because this is the biggest fight of his career. He's coming in. He stands, you know, granted the odds are against him, but you still have a puncher's chance. He gave Abraham a good a good fight. Rematch, not so much in his favor. But you would have thought that would really drive a fighter. And that's a perfect example because Paul Smith was brought in as an opponent for Abraham. And he, and he you know, Abraham was a large favorite. And Paul Smith fought really well in that first fight. And you know what? He got a second fight after that with decent money, and he got the Ward opportunity. So even if he doesn't beat Ward, if he makes a good showing for himself, at least other opportunities, this lack of professionalism isn't going to do a whole lot for him. Now, he does a lot of commentary already, so maybe he has one foot out the door in his career. I don't know. But it was it was a bad showing. It, it didn't speak highly of him. Yeah, disappointing. I mean, what positives could we take from this for Andre Ward he looks I mean he looks fresh in my opinion he looks hungry he it looks as though he had never left his jab it was always there it was well timed I thought his punches were really good I thought he started off very well the first three rounds had a little bit of a lull in terms of activity and then I thought he really turned it on in the eighth and ninth round uh, I didn't think his legs looked all the way back I didn't see he, he can do some very quick lateral movement, creating angles. He was very, to my eyes, he was a kind of a straight line uh, fighter in his movements. Now, that might be ring rust. It might be age. That's the most fascinating thing that I'm interested to see, uh, that he looked a little less mobile to me. I don't know if that's you know the opponent in front of him, age, ring rust, whatever. But his punches look great. His combinations look sharp. His right hand, I mean, he didn't even throw a lot of his left hooks, which is, uh, which is his best punch. Yeah. Uh, his right hand, his uppercuts were beautiful. I mean, the punching was crisp. The punching was very good. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a, a testament to how well Andre Ward 
keeps fit outside of the ring. We see it with Bernard Hopkins. We see it with Floyd Mayweather. And we see it with Andre Ward. He, uh, a, a great natural athlete, I want to say. Yeah, definitely. And what next for Paul Smith? Do you think this is time for him to call it a day? I don't know. I mean, again, when you when he's doing a lot of commentating, and sometimes I always feel like these guys have uh, you know one foot out the door. And so... Um, you know, he's shown that he's not going to be able to beat somebody at the top at 168. I mean, he could be an opponent if he wants a decent payday. I don't know where that fight is right now based on what he did against Ward. Um, I don't know. You know, he could fight some British-level fights for a few. Uh, it's really going to depend on what he wants to do with his career. I don't have a natural next step because he didn't look like a guy that wants to be in this business for much longer. Yeah, it's a... Sad state of affairs, but hopefully he comes to terms with whatever decision he does make. And right, and, hope- and apparently, I mean, I don't listen to Sky too much, um, but uh, just because I often will, will see the American feeds of fights, but I have watched Sky, and, and apparently Paul is very good on commentary. Oh, uh, always, a, always a good thing to see life after boxing, if anything. Yeah. Uh, Andre Ward, a man with many options, and we'll hear from that as well from Rock Nation COO David Itzkowicz, but for now... He could go up or down, depending on how he feels. Yeah, and I also wouldn't be uh, surprised if he stays at 168. Uh, I think after the fight, he said that that was most likely his natural weight. Uh, Virgil Hunter said that. Uh, I'd be interested to see the James DeGale fight. Um, DeGale recently won a title at 168. Um, Crafty guy, has a little bit of power. Uh, I think that's a good opponent for him. I, I, I definitely think there'd be interests on American cable networks. And, you know... Golovkin is down. I, I, I somehow have to think eventually that fight happens. Um, I think Andre Ward will be in in some really decent fights. It just may take might take another year to eighteen months. But I think somebody like DeGale is a great uh, a great choice. If Groves can win his next uh, fight, which is for a title shot against Badu Jack, I think Groves at least is a decent uh, name. I don't. I think DeGale has a better chance against Ward than Groves does, but. You know, there's, there are guys there that I'd be interested to see Ward do. I think he needs one more fight um, to see if he's all the way back. But, one, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, options. One other area as well is if he moves up a little bit to fight Sergey Kovalev, which could be a good fight in a lot of heavyweight. Oh, I mean, I think it's a spectacular fight. I, I, just, uh, I just don't see that happening soon. I don't see that happening particularly soon. But, I, yeah, we would all love that fight. Surprisingly, you haven't mentioned Carl Frock. It seems as he's gone a bit AWOL. I know he was talking to, to Golovkin. That's gone quiet. He mentioned that Frock couldn't sell out. but Sorry, he mentioned that Ward couldn't sell out, but Ward brought 9,000 out to Oakland, which was also interesting. Yeah, I just, you know, I think Frock, if he fights one more time, it will be, you know, some type of big event um, where he could win. I think they know he, they're not beating Andre Ward. Whatever the bluster is, like, it, it's a loss. You know, and I just don't see that as his final, as his final uh, play in the ring. I I don't see it. Yeah, no, nor do I. To be fair, I mean the first fight was so one-sided. I don't see how Frock would really change or adapt for the second fight if it were to happen. Yeah. Uh, but we were given a, a fantastic fight with Sammy Vasquez Jr. against Wale Omotoso. Yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, Vasquez is a. Uh, you know, a prospect uh, from uh, the Pittsburgh area, Southpaw. He, he spent a lot of time in the U.S. military. Uh, he was uh, in, with Iron Mike Promotions, which was Tyson's company, until that uh, folded up and then it got absorbed into Al Heyman. Uh, I think I might have seen one other Vasquez fight previously, but this was my first time you know, seeing him against a good opponent. and He was a lot of fun. Um, he throws a lot of power punches, aggressive, has boxing skills, and a very good amateur record. And uh, Wale uh, Amatoso turned it on in the end. Um, uh, in the uh, you know the later rounds, seventh, eighth, the eighth round I thought was a round of the year candidate. Uh, Amatoso doesn't really move his hands enough to, to win rounds a lot, but he does pack some thunder, and he definitely connected uh, towards the end of the fight. And, and Vasquez won comfortably. I think it was something like 98, 92. But his face was a mess. It was bloodied, all torn up. He was in a real fight. He was in a dog fight. And he came through 
and this was a perfect learning experience for him, and it was an example of very good matchmaking by Heyman. It's exactly uh, what you want to do with a young prospect, put him in tough waters, you hope that he makes it out, um, and you learn some things about your fighter, and, and Vasquez, in my opinion, passed all those tests with flying colors. He's an exciting guy at welterweight. Ironically, he's trained by Michael Moore, would you believe, who was last seen leaving the uh, Freddie Roach's gym in Hollywood. Now yeah. he's in charge of Sammy Vasquez Jr. So uh, hopefully, you know, he uh, he can take him all the way, get him into some some title fights if they do exist on PBC. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, the notion of title. You know, it's kind of funny. So uh, earlier in the week uh, on the Sean Porter undercard was Errol Spence, who is also welterweight and is one of the prized prospects in the Heyman stable. So you got a chance to see two of their – uh, two of Heyman's up-and-coming welterweights, and they both looked very good. I think Spence may be a little more polished uh, at this this point in time in his career, but they're both those are both two welterweights on the rise that I expect to hear a lot more about in the next few years. Yeah, and just on touch on Errol Spence, Jr., I know he did fight Phil Greco at the last possible minute. I believe it was a couple of days' yeah. notice, so don't know what we could take from that, but nonetheless, a talent to be seen. And yep. A fight we look forward to seeing in the future. We are, uh, and we also will now approach the upcoming fights. We have this Saturday. We have a, a really good fight, I want to say, and possibly fight of the year with Timothy Bradley against Jesse Vargas. We'll see. Um, I always go back with Tim Bradley since the Provodnikov fight. It's I think this fight is going to be as difficult as Bradley makes it. So I think he has enough skill and experience and athleticism to outbox Vargas. However, Bradley has been wanting to become more fan-friendly. He believes, for whatever reason, he's more of a power puncher now. And so he likes to take risks, often when he doesn't need to. So I think it's very possible that he thinks that he can, you know, really take it to Vargas on the inside and try and knock him out or try and do some damage and if that is the type of fight that Bradley wants and then I, I believe boxing fans are in for a treat and that's why I think it's it's funny because we're seeing a different side of Bradley a fighter that he wants to become but he may not necessarily be right he's and, taken... and, it, and he still only has like 11 KOs or something like yeah. that you know like his record is still what it is and for whatever reason he believes he's some type of power puncher I mean it's fun it's created a lot uh, it's created some very good fights uh, for fight fans, but um, you know Vargas is kind of a wild card too. He he does a lot of things well, doesn't have natural power, but has good athleticism. Uh, sits down on his shots, you know, not that they're that hard, but they're solid. They score well. They connect. He's been the beneficiary of a few generous decisions over his career, but he's not without talent. Um, this could be one of those fights where it could be really exciting or very technical. So I'm not exactly sure how it's going to go, but it has the potential to be very good. What's your thoughts thoughts on it? Who do you think is going to edge this one out? I like Bradley here because I think everything that um, everything that Vargas does, Bradley can do better. However, you know Bradley goes through these undisciplined spells. He doesn't listen to his corner. He doesn't do what's best for him. So I could see scenarios where Bradley loads up on big shots, and then Vargas just outboxes him. Yeah. So I have it. I think it's going to be like a like a one sixteen one twelve eight to four Bradley win with Vargas having uh, you know good moments, some very good moments. Definitely not the knockout. I, I'll agree with you there. It's yeah. more than likely going to go with Bradley's way over twelve. But like you said, you, you never know with Bradley because as he takes you know more and more punishment in every fight, could Vargas stop him? Do you think that's a possibility? I think Bradley's chin is pretty good. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we, we've seen him down before, but he's one of those fighters like Marquez. But, you know, he gets down, but he comes up. I mean, if he survived that Provodnikov onslaught, um, his chin's pretty good. Um, let's never say never, but I, I don't, you know, I, I think you can get Bradley down. I don't, I'm not sure you knock him out. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Bradley's half, he's, he's, Never going to stay down, and he's proven it time and time again. Yeah. Um, on to our, our main area of the show tonight. We spoke with Rock Nation COO David Itzkowitz earlier on this week, fresh off uh, 
back-to-back, I want to say, Rock Nation events with Miguel Cotto and Andre Ward. Uh, it's They're fortunate, Adam, in the fact that they have two huge fighters who, ironically, can pick and choose whoever they want to fight. They're that big now. They're well-established. And, uh, yeah, it, it was just a great time to be in boxing, considering we have more and more promoters getting involved. Uh, some sad news, though, because, as you had 50 Cent's promotional outfit, SMS Promotions did fold. But, yeah, onwards and upwards, right, Adam? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a tough business, and there's always going to be new promoters that come in. And uh, Rock Nation has the Jay-Z backing and some high-profile fighters. But, you know, what's going to sustain that company, as any new company, is the strength of your pipeline and your prospects. So they have signed a number of younger fighters, and much of it will depend on how well they develop because... You know, Cotto has, I don't know, two or three years left. Um, Ward has some more time, but that's not enough to form a stable. It's really going to be those young guys coming up. And if those young guys are successful, that breeds that breeds them or gives them the ability to sign more people. And that's really what it is. It's getting that pipeline going. Definitely. And a great way to lead on to David talking to us. So, yeah, this is David Itzkowicz from Rock Nation Sports. See you Firstly, a great show at Madison Square, uh, sorry, at, at the Barclays Center, and it was the fourth highest attended boxing event. Uh, the format, once again, uh, brilliant. I believe you attracted a new class or a new generation of boxing fans. Can you tell me more about how you felt the show went and what you felt went really well? Uh, well I, I thought, uh, you know, the show from top to bottom was, was great. Uh, we had a great crowd. Uh, we had a, a, an energetic crowd. We had great fights. We had a, a great result in the main event. Um, again, you know, just from a visual scan of the crowd, to me, it looked like we had a, a, a crowd that was a little bit younger skewing than than what you normally see at a boxing event, which is, you know, one of our goals is to is to attract um, a younger a younger audience. And, you know, I thought the, the entertainment that we provided um, outside of the boxing, you know, that, that obviously went on in the ring, um, was, was excellent. Um, I thought Big Sean went over very well. I thought it worked. I thought people were into it. Uh, I just think overall the event was, was a great success. What did you think about Miguel Cotto fighting uh, for the first time at the Barclays Centre and to kick off the Puerto Rican Day festivities? Um, well, look, you know, Miguel is, has always, you know, had an association with, with Puerto Rican Day Parade Week. Um, you know, it was great to have him in, involved in it again. Um, you know, his fans turned out uh, in, in droves to see him. Um, he didn't let them down. Uh, they, were, they were loud. They were passionate. There was an energy at Barclays Center that I haven't really seen before at, at a fight there. And, you know, Miguel's fights in New York, they, they do bring a kind of a special energy, and I think we saw that. Yeah, and it was a great performance by Miguel. And he really, once again, proved that he's a dominant player in the middleweight division. What do you see as the next logical move? I know there's talk about the canelo Cotto fight, but let's not forget, Cotto is in a, a position where he could choose and fight anyone he wants he's got everyone calling him out um well you know it, it's it's no secret that um Cotto Canelo is a, a fight that is being discussed um it's a fight that I think in my opinion is the biggest fight in boxing that can be made right now um it's a fight that Miguel wants um it's a fight that Canelo wants it's a fight that we want it's a fight that Golden Boy wants I think it's a fight that everybody wants um you know, that being said, I, I think that um, it, you, know, you, you mentioned um, Miguel being able to pick and pick and choose and call his own shots, which he, you know, is in the fortunate position of being able to do. And because this is the biggest fight in boxing, and and you know, probably you know, it, it, the fight that can compensate Miguel best, or you know, one of the top two fights that, that can compensate him best. Um, it, it's a fight that that we're that we and he are looking forward to getting made. Do you think there's any truth in the fact that Floyd Mayweather has now been talking 
about Carter in a very positive manner and he's on the look for opponents. Rumours have been spreading that it's something that, that could possibly come to fruition. What do you think about that? I, I haven't heard that. Um, and regardless of you know whether or not um, it, it, he has been saying that, Floyd has a relationship with Showtime and Miguel has a relationship with HBO. I mean, obviously we've seen HBO and Showtime work together recently. However, I, I don't see it happening for for a, a Mayweather Cotto fight right now. And with Miguel, he, he it seems though he's coming into fantastic shape. How many more times would you see him fighting towards the end of this year? I know he's got probably one fight, but next year as well. Um, well, one, it was, it's funny that you say that because one of one of the comments that I made um, during and after the fight was that he looked very fresh to me. You know, I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of talk is made of, of ring rust and, and, you know, guys being out of, the, out of the ring too long. And Miguel was out of the ring for, you know, it wasn't exactly a year. It was 364 days. But he, he looked fresh. He looked young. He looked, he looked like I haven't seen him look in a long time. Um, I, I think that, you know, obviously we'd like to see um, the Canelo fight happen before the end of the year. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in that fight, you know, before we talk about what's next. Um, but, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it would be crazy to think about, um, you know, Miguel then fighting again in the spring next year. Would Miguel or yourself, and you don't have to come if you don't want to, but would you be happy to pay Golovkin the step-aside fee that he's been asking for, or would you be happy to vacate the belt just to make the fight happen? Uh, I, I think that, you know, look, Miguel um, wants to defend his title. He's proud of his title. Um, you know, he, that, that title represents something to him in that it, it, it made him the first Puerto Rican to win world titles in, in four weight classes. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to do what we, what we can to make sure that, you know, he gets to keep that title, um, you know, and if a Canelo fight is made, which is everybody's goal, we would like that fight to be for the title, obviously. What did you think of Gary Shaw's comments about the weight? And we all understand that the weight was clearly labelled at the point of signing the contract. But what are your thoughts, especially as we move on to Andre Ward and that weight debacle? Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, in terms of catch weights, I mean, I, I think that, you know, look... Daniel Gill agreed to the catch weight, and you know, you know, he didn't really hear Daniel complaining about it too much. As Miguel said in the lead up to the fight, you know, look, when he had to, when he fought Manny Pacquiao, he had to agree to a catch weight. And you know what? If you don't want the fight, you don't agree to the catch weight. You don't do it. You know. And Daniel Gill wanted this fight, and he agreed to the catch weight. So, you know, he did it, and, and hats off to him as, as a professional, you know, despite, you know, all the, you know, there was a, there was a lot of talk before the fight that he wasn't going to make the weight, that he wasn't going to try to make the weight. You know, Daniel was, was a professional, and he, he made the weight, and, and, you know, that was it. I, I think there was a little too much talk of, of catch weights, you know, going on here. You know, if, if someone doesn't want to fight and they don't want to agree to fight at a weight, then they don't take it. I mean, it's it's not a, it's not exactly analogous to. I mean, if someone's you know a, a, a fight a fighter from a higher weight class coming down to fight somebody at you know at at the weight limit of a weight class, it's it's akin to them complaining about it. I mean, it, you don't, you know if you don't if you're a 168 pound fighter and you want to fight for 160 pound you know, you want to fight a 160-pound opponent, you know, either you're going to have to make that weight or you don't. If you don't want to fight, then you don't make that weight. You don't agree to do it. That's a good point. I mean, the, the, it was clearly outlined and labeled as such. There were no surprises, so... Yeah, when we yeah. made it, you know, it was very clear. I mean, it was, in our, it was in our contract, of course, you know, that he knew going in that this was the weight and they agreed to it. To wait, you know, to wait until the week of the fight to start complaining about it, I mean... You know, and again, I, you know, Daniel didn't really complain about it that I heard. Um, but, you know, look, if you don't want to fight at a certain weight, don't take the fight. 
I completely agree. And it was a, a different outcome, a different situation come way in for the Andre Ward fight. Could you tell us more about that, especially how uh, how angry yourself or Ward must have felt with Paul Smith coming in way overweight? I mean, at first I was shocked because when we were negotiating the fight with um, with Matchroom and with Paul, they wanted the weight to be lighter. They wanted the fight at 170, um, which was kind of surprising to me that he came in, you know, that he came in as heavy as he did. Um, you know, in, in speaking to Eddie and to Paul, you know, he, you know, they said it was a miscalculation and on his part in terms of how much weight he would be able to lose in the normal course of his cutting weight. And, you know, while he needed to lose, with you know, whatever it was, seven pounds or six pounds, he said he, he was only able to shed two. And he said he was retaining water and the, the weight just wouldn't come off of him. Um, you know, look, in, in, in the end, you know, I, I don't, you know, it, it doesn't appear that it, it gave Paul any sort of an advantage in the fight. Um, you know, there were some people that were, were suspicious of the fact that he came in heavy to give himself an advantage in the fight. But, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, it didn't actually matter. Um, you know, Andre was, was gentleman enough to, you know, after the fight to give Paul back all the fines that, that he had racked up in, in not making weight. Um, but, you know, I, I was surprised more than anything. And, you know, look, whenever a fighter doesn't make weight, you're angry because it creates it creates a whole mess that you, as, as the promoter and as the opposing fighter, should not have to deal with and worry about. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, you know, we got through it. No one likes to go through it, but, you know, we dealt, we dealt with what we had to deal with. Perfect. And can you tell us more about the card in Oakland? It seems to be well attended. It was live on BET, which presents a, a different scope, I would say, for Rock Nation and really diversifying yeah. the brand. Yeah, I mean, the, the event was, was very well attended. We had over 9,000 um, in the building. Um, and for, for that, you know, for that to be the backdrop of our first event on on BET was great. I mean, we had a, you know, similar to Miguel's fight, we had a very vocal, amped up crowd that was, you know, full of hometown spirit, given the Warriors just winning the NBA title. Um, you know, it was just a great atmosphere all around. You know, I, 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 I hope that that came across on the broadcast. Um, you know, I, I, in, I, I've seen bits and pieces of the broadcast. I haven't seen the whole thing yet, but, you know, just the crowd, you could hear the crowd erupting when, when the towel came in. You could really, you know, that came through on the broadcast. And, you know, it was just all around. It was a great event for us. The crowd was, like I said, very into it. And again, you know, we had a great host in the arena in Sway who was from the area. Um, he was very well received. Um, you know, our, our artist was, was well received. And just again, overall, I, I thought it was a great event and a, and a great success. And it looked as though Andre Ward hadn't had spent a day outside the gym. He made it look really that easy against Paul Smith, who came in heavier, should have applied his power, but just couldn't break down Ward. How did you feel about Ward's performance? Um, I I was again pleasantly surprised. Um, he didn't he didn't seem to show any any real rust to me. I mean, I think that's that's a credit to who Andre is as as an athlete and as a, as a fighter he um you know andre lives well he doesn't you know he doesn't blow up really big and he takes care of his body and he's never really out of shape um you know miguel's the same way so i think i think that you know that has something to do with it that um you know the 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 athletes that they are i think help them to to not show and the rust and to look, you know, to look as, as good as they did without, you know, look like they just hadn't missed a beat like they were in the ring, you know, four months before. Do you see Andre Wood coming back? And you said he's been out for 19 months. That clearly indicates that he's hungry to get back in the ring once again. When do you he see is, him? Um, oh. You know, when we first sat down um, with Andre um, earlier this year to talk about, you know, game plan and what he wants to do, 
you know, Andre is the kind of guy that, you know, economics permitting, he'd like to fight three or four times a year, you know, un, you know, unfortunately, you know, four times probably isn't realistic just given, um, you know, the, the economics of an Andre Ward fight. Um, but, you know, we, we'd like to see him back before the end of the year, obviously. Um, we're, we're starting to talk now with him and his team about what, you know, what, What's what what's coming next, and and what direction he's going in, in terms of weight, which will you know obviously dictate a lot with respect to what our what our plans are for him and what our conversations uh, with HBO will be um, moving forward. So just to clarify, Andre Wood isn't committed to BET. That was just a, a one-off, or just no, he's 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 not committed to BET. He's you know, he's a network free agent. Obviously, he has a, a very good relationship with HBO. Um, and, you know, that's that's where, you know, we're going to be going to in terms of the network to talk about his next fight. But, no, he, he's not signed to BET. He's, he's not signed to HBO or Showtime or anybody else. Um, so he's, uh, you know, he's a, a TV free agent, so to speak. Okay. No, that makes perfect sense. But... Like Miguel Cotto, Andre Ward has everyone else calling him out. I know Carl Frock has made some noise. Golovkin is always willing to go up or down. Do you think that should be the next type of fight that Ward should be going after? And I'm bearing in mind he had the time off and he's still getting back into it all. I mean, like, like I said, uh, you know, we we haven't had any meaningful conversations with with Andre and his management um, about you know how he felt and what he wants to do next. Um, you know, look, there are, obvious, there are two obvious paths that that can be taken for Andre. If he decides to stay at 68, a fight with Golovkin is something that becomes, you know, interest, you know interesting and, and sort of like the target. If he decides to go up, you know, then you're sort of, you know, you're looking at Kovalev as, as, as sort of the, the end game of, of, of moving up at, at 75, up to 75. So, you know, there, there are two paths that we've sort of discussed already, and I've said publicly, I've spoken to Tom Loeffler, and I've spoken to Kathy Du, but just in general, you know, broad strokes about, you know, something you're interested in, what do you think of the timing, you know, when could we do this, what's the roadmap? Um, I've had those conversations with each of them. Um, so it, it really becomes, um, you know, a question of, you know, how did, how did Andre feel at 72 and how did he feel fighting a bigger guy and how did he, you know, where does he gauge himself in terms of, you know, readiness for, for a big fight like a Kovalev or, or a Golovkin coming out of the fight this past weekend? That, I mean, either fight there, which you just mentioned, is huge in its own respect. So definitely a lot to look forward to. Well, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, Andre's Andre's in a great position, similar to Miguel, in that he gets to, you know, sort of sort of say, you know, this is this is the, direct, the direction that I'm going, and this is who I want to fight, and let's fight. Um, oh, that's a great segment into our next uh, area of discussion, just about the future of Rock Nation for the rest of the year. I know you've had your two huge marquee events. What else have you got planned? Um, well, obviously, we discussed, um, you know, the, the possibility of Cotto, Cotto Canelo. Um, so we'd like to see that happen before the end of the year. We'd like to see Andre fight before the end of the year. Um, we're looking at probably two um, two other BET dates before the end of the year. Um, we're um, looking at a um, another Fox Sports uh, one date before the end of the year. Um, and, you know, we're still, still looking at fighters to sign, um, you know, so there could be, you know, other, other, you know, fights here or there, depending on, you know, if we sign a fighter that, you know, is, is, you know, worthy of an HBO or a Showtime slot, um, you know, there could be additional fights coming that way. And then, you know, we'll just be looking to keep our younger fighters busy as well. So, yeah. David Itzkowicz, very, very insightful. A lot a lot that he discussed about Cotto, uh, pretty much being able to choose whoever he wants, uh, and rightfully so, he's earned that. And the fact that he, they're looking at the Canelo fight primarily, but they're open to other, other fighters. I did raise the point of Floyd trying to come in and 
try and get a rematch with Cotto. What did you think? What do you think about Adam? Well, um, I don't think I don't know if Mayweather Cotto is going to be a fight that is going to. Um, I don't think it's going to materialize. Let's put it this way: um, the fight wasn't as close as some people lead you to believe. Uh, I don't. There's the Freddie Roach angle that Cotto has now. Um, maybe that's helps sell it. I, I just. I just don't see how Cotto is going to win that fight, and I guess it, you know it gets a million pay-per-view buys, and that's fine. I just don't, I just don't see that rematch happening. I don't think there's a need for it in the marketplace. I don't think there's any unresolved issues in the first fight. So that's not to say it won't happen, but it's not something I'm looking forward to, and I probably don't think that's the first. I, I, I don't think that's what we're going to see in September. I did raise the point of whether Cotto would be willing to pay Golovkin or drop the belt step aside uh, David seems to strongly believe that Cotto will keep the belt which would mean either a step aside fee or maybe he actually takes Golovkin up on his offer if he can't reach terms with Canelo it, it, it's just an interesting triangle I want to say that we have going on as well yeah I, I believe that Cotto and Canelo will happen in November uh, or December of this year I think that's the fight we're going to see it's going to be fantastic uh, it'll be a nice pay per view we'll do well and, uh, you know, you have the Mexican-Puerto Rican rivalry. You have Cotto, who has been a star for over a decade. And you have Canelo, the fast-rising star in boxing. It's going to be fun. I, I mean, all boxing fans would like to see that fight. Um, all boxing fans would enjoy all those other points of the triangle as well. They'd love to see Golovkin and Cotto, and they'd love to see Golovkin and Canelo. So all of those, each of those fights would excite people I think we see Cotto Canelo in November yeah and speaking of Golovkin he did mention that Ward could come down to fight Golovkin Ward could go up to fight Kovalev as we had mentioned earlier it really a great place for Ward to be he can choose his own destiny I want to say well I don't believe that Ward's going down at all um, despite what's said it's it's like Golovkin's camp saying Golovkin's going down to 154 uh, I've seen no evidence that he wants to go down I've seen no evidence that Ward is going to go down I think it's possible Golovkin can come up to 168. Uh, I definitely think that's possible, and I think I, I just don't think we're going to see Ward at this point in time in his career, you know, fight, you know, fight below super middleweight. And back to your point of fighting James the Gal, I suppose. But anything is possible. You never know. Chavez Junior might resurrect himself once again and uh, somehow stake a claim. But I don't know. I, I just don't see. I, I don't. I don't see him as being relevant uh, to to a top fighter. Um, I, I I I don't think Chavez's team would want to take on Ward. I'm sure Ward would love the payday. Uh, but you know, I think Chavez is just going to be hopefully some lower level cash cow. And you know, if he fights somebody like Ward, he, he gets abused. So I, I don't. I don't see that happening. It's funny how the, the tables have turned, I suppose, for Chavez. But can't really uh, can't really say it wasn't coming. Yeah, so uh, great, great speaking with you, Adam. Yeah, well, we we covered some me, some great grounds. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Al Heyman and yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah David Iskowitz from Rock Nation, Bob Arum, uh, Todd the Buff, Adam Abrams from Saturday Night Boxing. Uh, any uh, any closing words for you, Adam? Well, just thanks, and and uh, you know got a, got some a little bit of a lull after this weekend uh, in terms of big fights. Uh, there is Thurman. Uh, in July, but I think Bradley Vargas could be entertaining. I don't think the fight, it's been such a busy uh, boxing calendar the last two months that I think this fight's gone a little bit under the radar, but people are tuning in. I think we'll uh, we'll see a good, a good solid matchup between two guys who are going to give it their all, and there's a lot on the line, so I'm looking to Saturday, I'm looking forward to Saturday's fight. Can't, I can't wait for it as well. Make sure you read up about it on Saturday Night Boxing as well as give us a four or five star rating on iTunes. We always appreciate that. And any questions, email boxing at outlook.com. And that's that's all we have for you. So from myself, thanks, and from Adam. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.